That's uh, Herc Pastor Tensel. Your own wraps. Yep. Thank you. This is an audio slate for dive H2021. UTC time is 19.05. Scratch that, 19.06.05. Mark. All stations, that's Atlanta and her uh, clear of Nautilus. Makes sense. do is Whoop. 
chair. Not working. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Dive 2021. Good morning. How is everyone this morning? I'm doing uh, very well. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah? I'm excited for this dive. It, this control, is going to be control, a very exciting deck, dive. We have people that are already checking in with us wanting to know what it is that we're going to see. Copy. We are headed off the, well, we are off the northwest coast of Kona. And we are setting out today to go observe, hopefully, some very large coral are you okay beds. With that? Go to we a ledge on the top of a plateau. Right. Silly craft. Huh? We have how many dives? <laughs> 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 Till the end of the season. Mm -hmm. So the, yeah, you, you might if you just heard the, maybe I'm just listening to the pilots, but the comments about the craft arm. Ridge, there's ridge, potentially now, a new craft position, arm waiting please. in the warehouse when we get back. So. <laughs> I don't know if that's the case, but <laughs> <laughs> there's talk. There's there a lot is talk. Of, there's momentum. I, <laughs> we do need to, Rob. We should think about something fun to do with the old arm, like some sort like, of even having it on board as like a static display or something. You no, know, it's it's gonna be a spare. You know. Yeah, there you go. I guess. Yeah. Are they that? Um, can you swap them that? Easily? Yeah, it's it's only four bolts. So one connector, uh, a couple of hydraulic lines, and four bolts, and boom. Spare it is. Just like that, boom. 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 I thought take, maybe take when like you... Take like a half hour or something. You maybe. come up to the social deck, the arms there, and you like high five it. Like, <laughs> like Notre Dame ball. when they're going out to yeah. play, like play like a champion today. You Although, know, you hit the yeah, there's probably some calibration differences, though, that might... I'd be excited for a... a uh, arm that's smart enough to have a no-go zone. What do they call that? The safety boundary? Yeah. This does have some of that sort of Oh, stuff. that model looks fantastic. Good job, Zach. The bottle looks fantastic? Yeah, the model he's working on right now. Uh, yeah. And I guess you guys got some on cesium. Is that... Yeah, yeah last night we... It, technically, it's for the second time, but it's the first time through 25. our kind of uh, standardized process now. We got the model from yesterday's dive right, um, uploaded, fully georeferenced, and it appears on the bit. right spot on planet yep. Earth. Awesome. Right. On Cesium. Yeah, it's going to be about 100 meters at 101. Yeah, this is going to happen zero pretty quick zero, today. Sorry. Yeah. Bridge, bridge, nav. Please move one zero zero meters at zero one zero. Copy, thank you. All right, so our descent will be a short one today. Everybody up for a quick round robin? Say hi to everyone that's listening yeah, that and watching. Good. All right, sounds good. My name is Devin. I am your SCF, Science Communication Fellow on board. Uh, I am here to field your questions and help deliver the information that we are uh, receiving on this dive as best as possible. And I've got some fantastic support all the way around me. Kristen, good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Kristen. Good morning, Kristen. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. 
Uh, I am in the data logger seat today, uh, trying to record what we're seeing as we uh, travel around today. Um, you didn't give your emphatic, I'm Dr. Kristen yes, Mitchell. Yes, <laughs> I am Dr. Kristen Mitchell. Uh, I work at the Office of Naval Research on the uh, Naval Internship Programs, and the applications for those close today at oh, yes. midnight Eastern. So we have high school, uh, undergraduate and graduate uh, programs that are available uh, and the applications close tonight at midnight Eastern um, for uh, paid internships next summer. Eight weeks for high school, um, eight weeks for high school and uh, ten weeks for undergraduate and graduate students. All are paid. So tomorrow's dive, can we get an update like real time how many applicants you uh, have? Yeah, I the should be board? able to see. Yeah, I should be able to see how many applicants we have. That's cool. That's yeah. a horrible circle. So I'm entering a high school student on production stuff. Can you describe a little bit about what opportunities are there for high school student level uh, for the internship program? So for the Nautilus internship program? Oh, no, 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 no. More oh. broadly, yeah. So for the uh, Naval internship programs, there are just about anything that the Navy does you could could try to do you can you know apply for so we have everything from ocean science to um, medical things to uh, ocean engineering we have naval art naval uh, history so we have a uh, sort of uh they're the same they're the same group that we participated in on the yorktown exploration oh yeah and yeah so the they may contribute here the next couple of days oh cool these potential archaeology yeah so archaeology yeah exactly so I mean, if you can think of it, I think the Navy probably does something related to it. So if you have interest in any kind of STEM fields, and even if it's not something listed on the website, you can always uh, talk to the coordinators. Their contact info is available on the website. So you can send an email and say, hey, I'm really interested in this. Would I be a good fit at your site? Yeah. Nice. The, the one thing, Jonathan, is that the, we were talking about the other day, that the internships are that Navy opportunity that you're seeking may not be local to you. And so there is like a uniqueness where you've got a, the lab that's close. If you mm -hmm. don't want to travel to your internship, you might not have all those Navy opportunities at your yeah. local lab, but like hubs like San Diego and DC yeah. and other places, Norfolk, you yep. may have a lot more wider breadth of opportunity. Yeah, that's true. Some of the smaller sites that are a little further afield from those spots you, you mentioned, um, yeah, they might have limited, more limited options, but if you're able to travel, you can find just about anything that you you might be might have uh, interest in. So. And we're talking about you, Naval Underwater Air Sea Center, Newport, Rhode Island. Yeah. yeah. Needs to get oh, on board oh, guys, with this program. Some beautiful yeah. bioluminescence here. I think that's shimmer. It's like a shine, right? Of whatever it is. Yeah. It would. If we go lights yeah. off, maybe you. I don't know. It's, I think it'll. Yeah, I disappear. Think it's Oh. So it is just re highly reflectant, whatever that is. And it's it. We've seen it about 200, 300 meters the last most yeah. of these dives. I see Johan shaking his head. I wish uh, if Dana were here, he'd probably be able <laughs> to provide just a little bit. <laughs> We'd be hitting the sample with the eDNA sampler right now. If we were <laughs> probably hearing an extended story about the first time he ever saw. Stop. <laughs> Dana, uh, Dr. Dana Yoger. 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 Dr. Dana Yoger uh, studies uh, what he calls the Twilight Zone with a very specialized robot that we just had on EV Nautilus last month called Mesobot. If you're listening here, his, his work truly is both fascinating and, and revolutionary on how he has designed a robot with his team to um, sample and follow one of the greatest migrations on Earth, um, the migration of um, life in the ocean, right? Super and complex, yeah. Driven by the, driven by the sun, yeah. the amount of light in the water. I encourage cool. anyone that's listening to uh, check out our website, Nautilus Life, for the NA-155 expedition that we just got done. Um, and in fact, Jason Faye, our, our expedition leader for this one, was also expedition leader for the last uh, that last cruise. Learned a little bit more about Dana's work and, and the rest of his fantastic team. I guess I'll go next, maybe. 
Okay. Oh, yeah. Whoops. That'd be great. That introductions. Yeah. Well, we're starting. We we, yeah. we were, but that's okay. We, we always like to drag time. out Kristen's introduction into the whole internship discussion, so <laughs> it's all good. Tomorrow, you don't have to hear my my pitch for the internships. I hopefully will be able to update on the the number of applicants that we got, though. Yeah, yeah. That'll be exciting. Well, I'm definitely going to come prepared with some good biogeochemist um, questions for you tomorrow. Uh, so I'm uh, Jason Fay, expedition leader for for this trip. Uh, very excited to have the support of the Office of Naval Research for this expedition to uh, kind of the top five uh, most complex terrain locations within the Hawaiian Islands. And, and really, we're going to complex terrain to test the camera system in those environments. And uh, we're lucky enough to have just enough time in the schedule to do something like today's dive at this uh, precious coral bed location and hopefully to see some coral and sponge diversity, but then also just catch what we hope is uh, these beautiful coral colonies in uh, the highest resolution and, and potentially immersive content. It's going to be a can. beautiful addition to the 3D. Yeah, I think the output from the from this expedition is going to be these clips in uh, immersive, modeled, and in like 4K that are representative of each location that we visited. And it'll yeah. be different than what we've been able to produce on other Nautilus expedition, so I'm really excited for that. Yes. If I'm not doing this, I'm at the University of Rhode Island as the Associate Director of the Ocean Exploration Cooperative Institute, uh, which is a uh, five university, or a five uh, organization partnership, which OET is one of those. And so uh, I'm kind of in the overhead um, organization that supports OET, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, the University of New Hampshire, University of Southern Mississippi, uh, and the University of Rhode Island in ocean exploration activities. Thank you so very much. Next in line. Uh, Captain, my name Captain is Camera. Captain Jonathan Camera. Feely, Captain, aka <laughs> Captain Camera. Uh, no, I'm, I'm Jonathan Feely, and the Ocean Exploration Trust uh, media producer, and I've been the uh, lead for this uh, Three beams, four beams. camera project um, that right, we can see right now on satellite feed one. Uh, this is officially called the Wide Field Camera Array um, that was developed with support of the Office of Naval Research. Um, these two stereo cams that you can see on satellite feed one are both 180-degree uh, fish eyes. So they allow a 180-degree view out of each one of the lenses. And um, yeah. it's been a fantastic yeah. so, so. Uh, project you're gonna, to continue yeah, on. Stop at, so we're... The um, DVL on yeah. Herc is seeing a few beams. Switching There's four the uh, acoustic beams, and uh, Bob, the pilot, just mentioned that we've seen three of them. That means we're getting close to the bottom. So we'll turn it over to the front row as we get close to get settled and kind of yeah, in the right place on the right target. Four beams solid now. Cool. Okay, gonna give you a reset. Right. There you are. Two. Jason and Robert, are we doing white balance today? Uh, we're not going to go right to the bottom, so you're going to have to remind after we get done with the Norbit survey and get down to the bottom and do it. Copy that. Okay. Copy that. Sounds good. This is a good heading, right? We're going to be heading... Um, sort yeah. Of, sort of a good heading. The ship is moving back, so it might I be mean, easier to get there. general right vicinity. Yeah, 340 is going to be our heading. Well, I'm right on it, then. Once we're lined up. And it'll be about 350 meters right. straight. Roger. Uh, Come talked. on, you want to try and spin around? Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
lot of interaction in the comment box. We appreciate that. We'll get to that just as quickly as we can once we get settled down on the bottom. Thank you for your patience. Bob, when available, can I get a hard power cycle on Triclops? Roger. What's the difference between a hard power cycle and a soft power cycle? The <laughs> camera's <laughs> severity <laughs> the problem. <laughs> the risk to the, the if they come back on or not. Uh, no, it's this, this, there's little risk. The camera's like in soft reboot, which means going into the settings and sending a command to reboot mm. the camera. But um, inside of the bottle, there's more electronics that are not controlled that way. Uh, zoom controller or a small Ethernet bottle. So I'm dogging a persistent issue with the zoom controller um, that requires and usually clears up after. So Robert, you asked it basically to unplug it and plug it back in yeah. digitally? Yeah, that's yeah. correct, yeah. Cool. Take, just yank the power plug <laughs> out of that computer, only to be used. <laughs> In times right. of need. Robert, are you looking settled? Uh, yeah, I'm just going to ladder over position. a little bit just to get it lined up right. That sounds great. You could start your start your deal there. Data lab, data lab nav. You ready for Triclops power? Roger, thank you. Chris, we're pretty much in position to start our Norbit survey, if you are ready. Okay. <sighs> Sounds good. We're still lateraling over a little bit, and then we'll have to start the ship, so you have a minute. Thank you. Mm. Robert, do you want me to just leave the camera and angle and everything right here? Perfect. Okay, looks like you guys are set. Looks like Chris is ready. So. Okay. Uh, what do you think? That we are at three zero meters right now. Copy that. Coming up to three five. Johan, can you zoom out on your screen just a bit? Uh, I'm just wondering how close we are to the drop-off. Do you think we'll be able to see that in the Norbit survey? The um, Maybe Chris can chime in. If, yeah. Uh, Looks like we can kind of see the edge of it. Okay. The corals in this area are heavily documented from 380 to 410. And with one species, and the other species was three, I think 380-ish to 450. So, you know, the the top of this plateau, the bank that we're on, plus, you know, a little bit down the slope will be the sweet spot for the two species that we're hoping to see. Chris, we're at three, five meters. How does that look?
You're all zeroed in, right? Copy that. Yeah. All right, we'll start the ship going then. Just double check. Bridge, bridge, nav. Hi, can you track a line forward with our current heading at a bearing of 341, please? Awesome, thank you. All right, so the objective of today's dive is to, to model and immerse, catch, capture immersive content at one of these, or a couple of uh, these coral colonies. And, and we're hoping that they're associated with some vertical structure. So our first uh, tool that we're gonna use to help find potential locations is a is a short Norbit survey with a multi-beam sonar that's on the on Hercules and so uh, Chris Krasnowski is in the data lab running the Norbit and that's going out on sat feed 3 and uh, we hope to be able to see boulders and rocks and outcroppings and then catch a few of the beams over the ledge just to know where we are and then we'll we'll go to it to those targets to um, to assess the health and size distribution species of the coral communities that are associated. And then we'll hop target to target over the course of this six hour dive. And when we run out of time, we'll come back up and, and get on to the next site. So it should be a action packed. The Norbit's great because it does provide us this, you know, uh, insight over a wider area, the situational awareness of the seafloor um, that we wouldn't have had otherwise. And so just longer range, bigger aperture of, uh, and that was perfect timing for that explanation. Thank you for that, because we did have someone asking, what were they looking at on set feed three? Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah, and once we get rolling and Chris gets set, uh, he can run through all the different windows that he's got up and what he's hopping between and why he's optimizing this versus that. Um, but maybe give him a minute, because we're just in the early, early Still throws. Still getting everything set up. Survey, yeah. Finding that sweet spot so we can get these images going. In the meantime, I, there has to be at least five times on here someone has asked about the pump, the great pumpkin experiment from yesterday. Everybody wants to know what happened. Oh, yeah. It looks like Ada's on the move. Uh, it was, there was a result. There was a result. It was anticlimactic. It was. They uh, neither so imploded, exploded, or became saturated. They were exactly as we left them. Yeah, so there, that means that there was no air inside of them. They were full of uh, gourd, whatever the meat. Matter. <laughs> they were full of gourd. <laughs> I love it. I guess. Uh, and yeah, so no. They returned to no the surface change. exactly as we had sent them. So it was quite interesting. They still had the same texture, still had the same color. Yeah. Hardness. Everything. It was. It was quite interesting. I'm glad we did it because it was a. It was a fun, appropriate Halloween little experiment. Yeah. So. And that's what science is. You, you get out there and you put things out there to see what's going to take place and happen, and then you can make discoveries based off of that. And if we were talking about it here, I'm sure there was some kids talking about it with their parents or Absolutely. friends about what would happen. Or So that's all good. I know we have a group of 20 students that are listening and watching with us right now. Oh, it's nice. exciting. Yeah. Do you know where? They did not say where they were from. Maybe they'll chime in and let me know. But the kids were all clapping as soon as we put Hercules in the water. Oh. I'm sure they were cheering, Hercules, 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 <laughs> Yay, Hercules. Yay. I know Buffalo, New York has joined us. Uh, Smoky Bear. Anybody the, familiar the with Smoky City. Bear? Uh, in Buffalo? Uh, Smoky Beats, I'm sorry. There's someone named Smoky Beats, also known oh. more along the lines of Timothy. Yeah, we got to be careful calling out some of these names because we may be, I'm not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not hip enough to get to, <laughs> to <laughs> I might get caught with, with the. 
And a couple of questions of that lets us know that we've had other followers as well um, joining us today from yesterday, concerned about our winch. How's it, how's it working? Uh, yeah, maybe Robert could give us an update on the winch and all the troubleshooting. Uh, we ended up replacing a power supply down in the winch room. So, so far it's so good, but it's been an intermittent problem, so I'm gonna not count my chickens yet. <laughs> yeah. So intermittent, but the, interestingly, the part of the thought process was that the beginning of the dive, the winch seems to operate fine. And so we maybe associated that with heat building up in the yeah. cabinet, mm -hmm. causing the power supply to degrade over the course of the dive. And so uh, Robert, they were able to identify that a lower voltage was coming out of that power supply than was required um, when it was failing. And so track that down to, we had a spare, and so we'll see how it does today, which was yeah. kudos to the ROV team and the deck team for thinking that all through. I don't think there's a connection or Dan a... kind of spoiled my experiment, but... Oh, the <laughs> 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 shut it off on you? Yeah. Yeah. He, I wanted to leave it on while it was broken, and then uh, he happened to walk by the box and saw that it was still on, and he normally turned it off, so he... <laughs> he, he did went the, over and turned it off. On did me. the right thing at the wrong time. <laughs> yeah. So if you're a high school student and you're interested in an internship with EV Nautilus, please go over to nautiluslive.org and click on the Join tab and then go down and do some uh, reading and some investigating uh, into the different programs that we have to offer. And that's where you should find the information that you're looking for there. Oh, and we forgot to mention the the Naval Internships website we is navalstemminterns.us if anyone's interested in those. Say that one it? more time. Navalstemminterns.us. Okay, there's another opportunity for an internship there. The application does close today, so it's something you'll need to get on right away. Yeah. Wonderful opportunities, though. Former SCF, Daniel, online with us. It's great to have you here. California and Rochester all online with us for Buffalo and Rochester great showing from Western New York today my my home neck of the woods ah. I love it Devin maybe we can keep going with the introductions or get that yeah if we have a belt. second to do that that would be fantastic yeah yeah Johan do you want to kick us off in the front row sure thing uh, hey everyone my name is Johan Becker uh, I'm the EV Nautilus I am a navigator, which means I kind of position the ship and make sure that we're in a good position during ROV operations and launch and recovery. Uh, my day job back home is uh, I'm a PhD student at the University of Rhode Island in ocean engineering. And yeah, excited to be here. Glad to have you yesterday. I think you and I ended up tying uh, with our costumes. It's probably for the best. Yeah, I think it worked out that way. <laughs> <laughs> that was quite a costume to haul out here. It really was. <laughs> Thank you, it yeah. was quite impressive. It took up half my carry-on here. So. <laughs> it's commitment. Yeah. Oh, you, you did all that with just a carry-on? Mm -hmm. wow. <laughs> I appreciate that commitment. I really so do. So you put the costume on when you're doing laundry then? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know that that would be <laughs> Uh, so I'm Robert Waters, and I'm sitting in the Hurt pilot seat. I'm the ROV lead on this leg, and my regular job back on the beach is uh, OET's facilities manager and ROV engineer at our facility in San Pedro, California. Uh, I work on new electronics for the systems. Yeah, and keep keep the warehouse in order. So I get to move everything when I get back. I jump, jump right into moving everything in the warehouse because they're doing construction and I gotta move it all out of the way. 
Do you have help for that, Bob? Or is that just... Well, they're, they're claiming I do. I, I mean, I'm the only one there. I'm the only OET employee in L.A. there. Yeah. They, they say they have a helper for me. So. If you want to set up a quick website for interns, we've got a... We've, <laughs> we've maybe we could get some volunteers to come to the warehouse and help move. I don't think they want to volunteer for that. <laughs> no, just don't tell them what it is. Help with ocean science engineering. Yeah, right. Yeah. Fundamentals. Modernization <laughs> equipment. Engineering 101. Logistics. Yeah. Yeah. It's Different. actually logistics is important in the Navy, too. So it could, yeah. be, it could be a good yeah. opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not really looking forward to it. We have a lot of junk. <laughs> I do remember quite the pile of electronics of years gone by. Yeah. Uh, I guess I'll go next. Uh, my name's Human Moeen. Uh, Can't I'm really hear you, Human. Can you hear me now? A little, little bit, bit better. I don't know how to bring up the sensitivity. I'll just talk louder. Um, so yeah, my name is Human Moeen. Uh, I am the ROV Atalanta pilot right now. Uh, I'm an ROV engineering intern on the Nautilus. And back at home in Los Angeles, I am a master's student in mechanical engineering at the University of Southern California. Hi, everybody. I'm we could Pete. just extend his internship for a, a few days. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I do have a volunteer already that's come up online that's ready to help you. Not far from San Pedro. An Willing and able. And go ahead, Pete. Uh, I'm uh, Pete Thorderson. I'm a video engineer today for this expedition. Um, I'm actually lead video engineer for this expedition for this watch. I'm uh, managing the uh, record systems in here. Um, what goes out sat feed three, uh, which is channel three, what you see on Nautilus Live. And uh, yeah, just uh, kind of, um, I'm, I'm also managing the um, Herc uh, Hercules Zeus camera, so zoom and focus, and um, just trying to stay out of the way of the triclops. Yes. Triclops. Triclops. It's a, it, is, it is very proud and very present in all of the shots right now. Yes, it is. We've got one more addition to the back row. Good morning. Oh, good morning. Would you like to introduce yourself and say hello to everyone? Of course. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Zach Taylor. Um, I'm over here joining this watch. This is going to be a short dive today. So they let me come up and, and work alongside Kristen in the data logger position. Um, so yeah, I'll be here helping ID things and keep track of the, the key things on this dive. Um, when I'm not here on the ship, I'm a graduate student over at UH Hilo, uh, just on the other side of the big island here. Uh, where my work focuses on uh, using remote underwater video systems for um, observations in the near shore reef. So, yeah, really enjoying this trip, having fun with all these cameras, and yeah, I hope we have some corals to ID today. Looking One for some beautiful things to see. One reason I really appreciate Zach is not just his invaluable help uh, processing the photogrammetry models in the data lab every night, but um, for this particular expedition, um, getting as many uh, IDs on these corals will be really valuable to uh, the longer term goals uh, with how we want to uh, communicate about this region using the three-dimensional models and a potential video game that goes down the road because the only thing better than a, a 3D model of a coral is knowing what that coral is and given the type of data that we collect uh, every single second on the ROV we can not just identify the coral but the temperature of that temperature gradient across the whole dive, the salinity, um, all, all of those elements um, that could be integrated in to make a truly dynamic uh, experience for, for viewers of the, the game. Can you tell us a little bit more about this camera system? Yeah, so uh, the camera system that we have uh, comprises of, of three different cameras. The two that you can see right now in satellite feed one are uh, dual 180 degree fisheye cameras. Um, they're, what, they're what's called a full frame sensor camera. So it's, it's a very large sensor, kind of the equivalent to a DSLR that you might have. Um, they're each shooting about uh, 24 megapixels uh, images, but they're, they're actually cinema cameras. So uh, really designed from the bottom up to capture uh, 
very uh, high fidelity images um, and they are exceptionally low light um, uh, tolerant sensors so they can really see in the dark as it were um, or at least in partial darkness so um, those two lens are currently providing a stereoscopic view so uh, something that would be suitable for creating um, kind of a 3d virtual reality experience or for projection in something like get? a large dome uh, we've moved 100 meters we have about 250 more All right. or if you've been in a, a area that has imax omnimax mm -hmm. which is uh, again a kind of a, a quasi dome theater projection okay. um, it meets the specifications uh, for that style yeah, of experience thanks um, the other thing that this camera system does very well is is uh, photogrammetry collecting photogrammetry data so we actually have a third camera um, that's currently on the brow of Hercules, so uh, towards the top on the big light bar. And it's pointed down at a 45 degree angle. And what that camera does is it, it provides a second view um, of the world around us. It's a very wide angle, so it maximizes. Are know. we seeing that in the uh, bottom oh, thank you. Yeah. right hand square? Yeah, on, on satellite, satellite V3. V3. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the main dominant image kind of behind the little circle is that view it's 45 degrees angles looking down so the combination of all three cameras allows us to very rapidly build up the type of data needed to create 3d models of the terrain as we pass over it um, whether that's a coral a rock etc so we we marry the visual data we, we put it through a process called um, uh, photogrammetry in this case we're using a program called reality capture which is um, one of many tools but uh, is exceptionally exciting because of how it integrates with unreal engine and some of the gaming platforms out there um, and it allows us to kind of passively collect this data so um, passive means that i just basically set the cameras up taking photographs and then we can kind of noodle around and do what we do without too much direction um, it's an example that the goal, which isn't the goal of this particular expedition, but the goal for, for myself is to say, um, what's the process that we can have this as an automated, regular part of future exploration? So how can we put the cameras? Where do we put the cameras so they're low impact to uh, the rest of our operations and, and so that the, the type of data we're collecting ends up being a net positive? Um, so that means getting the cameras out of the way of Zeus so Zeus can do its job um, and uh, getting the cameras out of the range of the manipulators and probably most importantly automating how we create these 3D models in the background, which we've been doing and throughout this dive if we're uh, really cooking on gas, uh, we'll no, just it. occasionally yeah. be able to um, uh, show you that model building process on satellite feed 3 as we do it in your real time. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty interesting to see. Yeah, pretty awesome. I'm seeing Zach over there. He's got a, he's got his giant notebook of cool corals. I do. We have all the corals. Is there something specific that you're hoping to see? Uh, not necessarily hoping to see. Um, we dove an area around this, so there's there's certain ones that we did see the last time that kind of expect to see. Um, so yeah, just just kind of going back and um, yeah, seeing if there's other ones. And it looks like we've been joined with uh, Dr. Dan Dietz um, for this watch. Dan, can you give yourself an introduction here? Sure. Hi. I'm 
I'm Dan Dietz. Oh, I get like a feedback. Do you hear it? Negative. No. Hi, I'm there. Yeah, that's much better. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Dan Dietz, uh, so I'm just fiddling in, but um, I'm primarily from the Office of Naval Research. <coughs> so I'm a program officer in the undersea uh, warfare area, and we do general science. So basic questions of, you know, why, you know, why do we have air-sea interaction? What's the inter impact of air-sea interaction on typhoons? What's the interaction on hurricanes? Um, do they intensify? Where do they go? So all those type of things to create better forecasts for meteorology or better modeling of understanding where do the currents take, you know, the garbage patch and yeah. just mm. really getting to understand what are the driving factors. And, you know, science always has additional questions. So that's what we do is we say, what's the next question we can find the answer to? Yes. I'm seeing some incredibly interesting uh, forms. Jason earlier was mentioning the application of Norbit as the first start of this expedition, or uh, I'm sorry, the dive. Um, and this has been a tool, this, multi, this high resolution multi-beam that's uh, relatively new to kind of our quiver of exploration tools. And I am seeing as uh, as a camera person and interested in photogrammetry and interested in coral diversity, just the utility of this tool. Um, looks like we're going over and revealing that there is some sort of uh, sharp feature, uh, a low rise, and an associated cliff directly under ROV Hercules. So. Yeah, Chris, are you at a spot where you're comfortable to explain what our viewers would be seeing in Satellite V3? Yeah, sure. Give me just a second to organize my chair in such a way that I can get to the mic easily. Sure. All right. Yeah, so here you see, this is, in general, this is the uh, Hercules high-resolution mapping system. Um, we'll start here with... I'm, I'm assuming this is going out on Sat 3, yeah? Yes. OK. Uh, right here, you can see the ROV at the center of this whole thing. And right here in this corner is where we have a uh, Norbit multi-beam sonar mounted. It sends out a beam of acoustic energy, a wide, flat beam. And you can see that here with this big fan. This basically represents the area that's insonified. You can think of it as sort of the area that we're lighting up with the sonar. Um, where this area intersects with the ground, we get a return. So you see this white line here shows the latest return. Mm -hmm. All right, and that's where the sonar thinks the ground is. These first few points coming in, these yellow points, are uh, the last, uh, right now I have them set to the last 10 minutes of returns. And the color scale on these represents backscatter. So you can basically think about that in terms of how loud the return was or how bright the return was in any direction. So if we were to shine a laser pointer at a spot, it would be like how bright that dot coming back is. So areas that are darker were had a quieter return and areas that are louder have a, uh, a you, you, brighter return. So you can start to see, we can see some like rocks and features over here. We can see this big crack down the middle, right? Another big rock over here. Uh, but after a while, that's a lot of points to store in memory. So we actually down, down sample those into what we call a terrain model. In this case, it's a grid, right? So, and that just basically is a 3D representation, uh, a 3D model of the data. So areas that are red are shallower and areas that are blue are deeper. And that's the uh, 10 cent tour of the Hercules mapping system. Thank you so much. It gives us a wonderful view um, of the topography that we're looking at, the bottom of the ocean floor. Yeah, I don't know if you can see, but it looks you see these like interesting like cracks in the uh, that we're starting to see. Yeah. All through in the backscatter. And do you have the like the process images that you had before? Are those available on the website? Uh, I know they've been floating around. Hang on. I can pull one of them up right here. Yeah, 
Yeah, so this was a similar survey that we did earlier, just of a large flat area, but you can see, so in this corner you can see there's a little image of Hercules, and here's some rocks and ledges and things like that. So this is the kind of final product that we'll be able to produce. So that's the scale, that's the, the rocks are the same scale as the... Yeah, that's correct. So you can see a little tiny dot there is Hercules. Uh, I have another survey. Let's see. It's an amazing representation of exactly just... Yeah, so here's another, here's another image that we did earlier. Um, yeah, this was a single pass that we did on one of the on one of the uh, features that we saw with the columnar basalt. So you can see Hercules here for scale, and this is the size of the feature. And did you add the lighting there? So. Yeah, yeah, I added the lighting. <laughs> well, you got you know, you got It's very I, realistic. I actually kind of like I actually kind of like the lighting because it sort of represents the area that we can see visually. Right. Right. Yeah. So like it looks pretty, yeah, but it also kind of shows like, yeah, that's really about as much as we can see, and even that is probably a little generous. Right. Chris, does the does the strength of the the signal you get back correlate to the type of material at all? It does. So acoustic backscatter, you can the analog in the imaging world would be uh, color or in or the intensity in a black and white image, right? So some of the some of the newer sonars will actually send out three different frequency pulses, and they'll get back three different backscatters, and they call that pseudo color image, right? So each, because every material has a different frequency response, just like every material has a different frequency response in color, right? Some things reflect red light, some things reflect blue, some things reflect green. We can actually do the same thing with sound with some of the more advanced uh, acoustic systems. Uh, who's making those? Uh, R2 Sonic is making them. R2 Sonic? Yeah. Uh. Yeah, they're doing some cool stuff. Is that a, a much bigger sonar? Or? No. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's actually a little smaller. Wow. Well, they have different sizes, but yeah. Yeah. It's, it's the same, same class. Um, they don't have quite as wide of a transmit beam, though, so they're a little less flexible in terms uh. of this, like, scanning vertical stuff like we are doing here. Yeah. But... They do have excellent res res resolution and some cool features like that. Quite expensive, though. Probably... Uh, I think they're similar to the Norbits. Uh. They're yeah, they're kind of direct competitors. They pluses so, and minuses to each. Yeah. Chris, with those cracks that you were talking um, along the, the the yellow part there in the seafloor, is there a way to gauge um, how wide or how deep those might be from what we're doing? Yeah, stand by. So if we zoom in here, yeah, you can really start to see them up close. Um, let's see, I can measure. So like that crack there, something happened. So it looks like that crack there is maybe 50 centimeters wide or less, for example. So I drew a... Measure. Yeah, that's. It looks like that crack is. I'm getting 45 centimeters. So yeah, that's the sort of feature that we can see with this system from this altitude. If we get closer, we can see 
smaller stuff. Now, does that convert over to um, the actual size on the bottom of the floor, or that is the actual size? Yeah, no, that's the actual size. Okay. So that just that just goes to show you how much detail um, this programming can do. It's 45 centimeters is. Yeah, because uh, we normally just have maps from the ship sonar. Right. Much much coarser. Yeah, they'll give you the, the ship sonar would give you the general features, but not uh, not these individual things like this. Wow. So we're we're picking up a one foot crack, and we're over a hundred feet above the surface right now. That's correct. Yep. It's amazing. It is amazing. And if we really go in and do an analysis of the backscatter, we can pick up a lot of times smaller features. Sometimes things, it's like, yeah, it's like in the visual world, right? You can sometimes pick things up in texture that you can't really pick up in, where you can't really pick them up in the just the plain shape. So What's we that could. Thing? <laughs> I don't know. I think I think the real power of this is the fusion. You know, being able to start with a ship sonar and saying, okay, generally this is your shape, picking out where you want to go, then, you know, getting a, these high resolution centimeter. So you go from, you know, t 50 meter grids to now we're talking centimeters. Yes. And then adding on the visual systems, now you're really getting the color that you don't get with acoustics. Right. So by fusing all this together, you're able to get the best map and a three dimensional map that our minds can really start to process. Absolutely. It's really tough to go through and be like, okay, I'm going to shine a flashlight as I walk down the whole trail. And right. Like, well, what does that trail really look like? You can, pick, you know, you remember little pieces, but then when you put it all together and you say, okay, here's the visual map. Yes. That's what we're that's what we're really going for here. Hey, Chris, um, we're about a hundred meters out of waypoint two, where we have a pretty uh, harsh turn to waypoint one. It's about 120 degrees or so. Uh, how do you want us to approach that? Okay, sounds good. It would if I heard what he said. What did he say? <laughs> <laughs> uh, he said blow past it a little bit and then okay. we'll come behind it and continue uh, this way. And to one of our viewers, Tim, that's exactly yeah. what uh, our goal is, is to be able to take um, the programming from the video games to create these virtual reality opportunities for people to be able to take a look at the bottom of the ocean floor exactly as we're able to map it and see it. It's going to be quite exciting once when it's all put together. What kind of turn rate do you want to do? One degree a second. Okay. Yep. We have the technology, so we can do that. It's been amazing to see all of this come together, just uh, from my perspective, brand new to the ship, and to just see how much we're able to put together the... Uh, 3D printing models that we've been able to do with the columnar basalts uh, formations that we saw and uh, then being able to take that and uh, use that into communities for people uh, who are blind to be able to give them a real good um, feel and structure of what those are uh, actually looking like for us to see. It's a wonderful opportunity for us to be able to reach out to all different types of communities to make this uh, clearly visible for everyone. And I think it goes beyond that. You know, there's there's the, the auditory learners and there's yes, the visual learners. For sure. And, you know, I think this really adds to the visual learners. Those who can see it and you can see the big picture and, you know, everyone has different learning styles. Absolutely. You can learn the techniques that do for you. So that differentiation makes it accessible to everyone. I mean, just, just putting this on, on as an option, I think will help out many, many, many people. Absolutely.
So you were asking how deep we are. You can actually see the ship here in the model, and that is also to scale. Normally we can't see it because we're so deep, but... I noticed that you put that on there. That looks awesome. Relatively shallow. Now you're just showing off, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, if you have the data, might as well display it, right? That's right. I agree. So the question is, where's Atalanta? Oh, oh, we won't, we won't oh, talk about that. <laughs> Seems to be some incomplete data. <laughs> <laughs> Robert, what's our top speed for Hercules? Our top speed? We yeah. Can, uh, Oh. We could probably do like a knot and a half, maybe. A knot and a half. How does that translate over to what our viewers might understand if they're not familiar with knots? <laughs> I can try to, I can Google you, it. I can see. What do you see. want it in? <laughs> uh, Miles per hour. Yeah, that's probably the most easiest for people to. 1.5 units. Uh, volume speed mass. Oh, where are we at? One point seven miles an hour. <laughs> yeah, like uh, somebody using a walker kind of speed. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a question for some folks in the van. What is the difference between miles per hour and speed over ground? Speed over ground. Yes, that is a, a nautical measurement. Anybody? One of them, I think, if I remember right, one of them uh, considers like the, the degrees around the Earth. So like if you're higher up, you're traveling faster miles per hour, but, but the same speed over ground if you're at the surface, right? Makes sense. So it is a different number based on your elevation from altitude. I think so. So if you're at ocean level, that is always sea level, correct? Yeah. But it could be different if you're in an airplane. Mm -hmm. Where you would have to go faster miles per hour to get the same speed over ground. Distance, yeah. yes. Copy that. Zach, I have someone that wants to know if corals are kind of like the mushrooms of the sea. Hmm. Uh, 40 meters, Robert. I mean, uh, not really. No. I feel like um, mushrooms, uh, they need very specific conditions, but they're very short. Like They just kind of pop up and, and go away. Corals are, they need consistent things long time for long periods of time. And... Um, yeah, they, they're, they're also animals, mm -hmm. <laughs> so that, that's yes. going to be a difference, too. I could see where they're thinking about, like, are they like the mushrooms of the sea? But to be honest, I don't I don't really know if there's anything like you can compare to a mushroom in the sea that yeah, that pops up, you know, just so quick and sporadic. And then, yeah. Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. Well, because they are their own animal in multiple colonies. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think the only thing you could really think is like the shapes can be similar at times, but like biologically speaking, they're right. they're, they're very very different. Very different. Kristen, is there anything that you're hoping to see today in particular? Not really, honestly. I'm just excited to see some of these corals and see if yeah. I can figure out what they are. Yes. I, I'm not much of a biologist, so anything bigger than a microbe, I'm like, I don't know what it is. I don't know what I'm looking at. <laughs> it's a coral or it's a fish. <laughs> um, 
So yeah, I'm excited to see what we see. Yeah, I am too. The, the size differences, maybe the color differences yeah. between them, the different shapes. Mm -hmm. It's going to be very interesting to be able to put all that together. Yeah, the color differences look like they could be pretty interesting, actually, just looking at some of the past papers. So, Robert, when you're on this point and doing your turn, uh, if it's all right with you, I'll move the ship a little bit to try to position it more behind you. Uh, or do you want to yeah, stand still? Yeah, how many degrees are we going? We going? Uh, our new bearing will be 218, so about 120 degree turn. About or exact? <laughs> <laughs> 122. 122, exact. There you go. That's what we want. So we can do a 122 meter turn. And we're going to go at, what was the rate of speed? One, one degree per second? Yeah, one degree per second. Okay. All right. Let's see how this goes. Hold on. You don't want to pull too many Gs in this one. Yeah, well, <laughs> one degree per second. <laughs> at 1.5 miles per hour. <laughs> well, no, we're going to be... Less than that, huh? No, we're going to be holding position in the XY plane and then doing a one degree per second rotation. Yeah. And the re so the reason that we need to turn so slowly is because the Norbit is actually looking out maybe 150 meters away from the center line. Uh, so when if you were to rotate quickly, that would the points at the end would actually be moving very, very quickly. Hold position, please. So we need to... Uh, we need to rotate very slowly so that the, the we don't move the edges of the beam too fast. Are we there yet? We are, yep. Yeah. All right. Holding position, and then uh, we're ready to do the turn. Here we go. We Buckle up. One degree per second. Is that looking okay, or is it too fast? Yeah, you could slow down a bit. I'm going to cut it in half. 0.5. Is that okay, or is it still too fast? No, this looks better. Gonna take a while. It's got a little wobble to it, but Yeah, that's alright. It'll not ideal, but it shouldn't make a big it shouldn't be a big problem. I've been looking back through previous research. It looks like the, I hope I get the name right, Gerardia coral could be something that we could see today. Gold, yeah. gold coral and with like tree like uh, samples through it. Yeah, 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 let me see. Yeah, there's going to be, I think, definitely some of the acanthagore today, which. Um, similar to that yellow gold. Um, we saw quite a few 
I think bamboo corals on the last dive as well. I'm not sure if that's what, uh, I don't have the same reference in front of me that you're looking at, but I don't know if that was one they also referenced. Um, Victor Gorgia? Probably. <laughs> Robert, do you want me to maintain the same uh, camera settings? Or do you want me to rotate with you when we? Uh, yeah, you, you're gonna rotate around. But not not till I get out in front. You'll you're gonna yeah yeah <clears throat> yeah. I think you just just keep it centered up. Yeah. In the this way. Yeah. Like the way that it was before. Or yeah. Don't don't tilt it. Yeah. Just do the heading change. Yeah. yeah. Once you start getting. Yeah, as I bit. start coming around. Yeah. yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. Okay, looks like your turn is pretty much complete. Yeah, I'm ready to start moving when you guys are. Okay, Robert, are you ready if I start the ship? You'll have to come in front of Ada, but you'll have a second. Bridge, bridge, nav. Hi, could you track a line at bearing 218, please? Yes, thank you. Yeah. 
Robert, would you mind coming out of Auto XY just for a second while I reset? What? You're going to screw me all up. All right, go for it. Sorry. <laughs> Dave's okay, here. done. Dave's here in video just for a while. <laughs> Look at those wiggles you caused, Johan. Yeah. Oh, Look at them. Jesus. Oh, <laughs> Broke it. That turn looked great. Thanks, Bob. Kristen, I know you're into little particles. I had someone asking about the little particles that we might be seeing that kind of float by through uh, satellite feed one, or maybe as you get through two. Can you share anything about that? Yeah, and it's mostly marine snow, I believe. Sort of things falling down out of the water column as they settle, just to, just as things die and and move down to the to the sediment layers. And the same way we se uh, shed our skin cells or our hair falls out, you get that same kind of Absolutely. thing happening with the organisms that live in the water column. Walk it a little bit. Exactly. And that's really can be um, important for the sediments. Okay. It can be a source of, of food depending on where you are and that sort of thing. So it's, it's that's certainly a, an important um, phenomenon that happens in the ocean. And as this trip has taught me, it's a great way to discover through environmental DNA. If we were to take a sample of that water, we'd be able to actually kind of determine what type of organisms live in that particular area based off of the DNA that's found there. Is that correct? That is absolutely correct. I am. I'm getting it. I'm getting <laughs> it. I'm so excited. This is such a new concept for me, and it was uh, just incredible to think about how we could be that specific with just a little sampling of yeah. water and the things that we find in it. Yeah, and there's also things that are living in this level. I just saw something float by that looked like it was kind of swimming along. So there's stuff that lives here too. So in these in these levels, yeah. and that you would also be able to see on eDNA uh, potentially as well. Robert, I have a viewer that's asking, is the is the pressure at the greater depth, does it make it harder for the ROV to maneuver? Uh, no, the, the density doesn't change that much. I mean, the, to where you would notice, like, you know, in maneuvering or anything. The, the uh, buoyancy changes a bit. Chris, do we have the ability to uh, penetrate through the ground and actually possibly see caves or anything that would be under? Um, we do, but not with this sonar. So they, Herc has a sub-bottom profiler, which is a much lower frequency. So it can actually penetrate through a little bit of mud and sand and okay. see substrate underneath. Yeah. So but that doesn't give you a big swath like this. That just gives you a single beam directly below the vehicle. Gotcha. Yeah, actually that's currently living on Argus, but there's there's talk about, since we're using Atalanta more now, moving the sub-bottom profiler over to Atalanta. But it's a much smaller vehicle, so it, it's going to be tighter to get that in there. So we're scheduled with this dive for approximately five hours. 
We appreciate those of you that have joined us. Thank you for your questions. Okay, you can center up on the heading. And we should be all dialed in now for this line. We got about 115 meters. Oh, this is a short one. Yep. Yeah, I think we're barely going to get past the edge of our last swath here. But that's okay. We'll get better data for that run, and we need to get there anyway. The point six wraps and the tether wraps are all good, right? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. When you're done with this, we'll square it away. Okay. Sounds good. What's the, is this the end of the sonar bit? Or is that, yeah. yeah, once we reach waypoint one. Okay. Then we'll settle down and kind of follow back. So our next dive scheduled is for tomorrow. Is that correct after this one? Is this the only one that we've got going on today? I believe so. Yeah. yeah. I don't think we have too much time past this. Yeah. So I think tomorrow is going to be your, um, your next best bet for uh, a dive. And okay. I believe that should be... I don't know that we have the official time set for it yet, Sounds good. but it's going to be a very interesting one. Looking forward to uh, some, some wreckage, I guess that's what we should call. Again, with that goal in mind of using the uh, photogrammetry so that we can get these 3D images, these 3D models that we'll be able to create and add to uh, the programming overall. Our maximum expected depth today is 419 meters, about 1,300 feet, a little bit more, 1,374. Kristen, do we have any kind of an indication uh, someone wants to know about the marine snow and determining how long it takes to reach certain depths? That's a pretty... Intense yeah. question. I know, that's a good question. I think that, it, yeah, the rates are pretty well established. Again, it depends what exactly is falling, but right. those rates are pretty pretty well established. So if we are able to look at the DNA, then we get an, an exact uh, specific species, then we know if we're able to go back and look at the specs on that particular species, how deep it can dive and where, where in the water column it lives, then it gives us a pretty good range of, of what that is and then we can i guess determine from wherever its collection point is uh and capture time i guess how long it's a bit a lot of math in there <laughs> yeah absolutely and it also depends on sort of the conditions in the ocean at a time if you have a rough right. sea you're going to have more things moving around a little bit quicker so yes those currents moving through yeah lots of variables too uh to factor in with that, but definitely uh, can at least get you close to something for yeah. sure. Great question. Yeah, it's an excellent question. It looks like on average though, around a couple of weeks is how long it takes to transit. And also it depends how deep the area as well is. So if it's a deep, you know, um, canyon or something, it would take longer for it to actually hit the sediment bottom. And stuff gets eaten on the way down too, so you might right. you might lose, you def certainly lose stuff along the way. And also expelled. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And that's part of marine snow. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah.
about 55 meters to go. Looks like Norbit was able to get some really good imaging in today. Really remarkable tool for even planning a dive like this. Um, we're going to start off this process with immersion um, filmmaking in mind using the pair of stereo cameras to record the full dual 6K image. Um, this will be a long setup for this style of work that end destination will be things like big dome theater projection, shared experiences at science centers, um, where kind of the deep ocean really wraps around a room or a theater experience. And then also we're able to create uh, 3D VR experiences to also um, put for the future of headsets and 3D coolness. You are the fish is the term that we've been putting for this style of flying. 3D coolness. Oh, yeah. I yeah, like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. I could use more technical terms, but let's face it, this is just awesome technology. Um, it's very exciting to be able to apply. So, uh, hey, what VR headset do you uh, have down there? Um, so far, we act, uh, r downstairs we have the new Oculus Quest 3, oh, yeah. which is still the most uh, supported of, of all of the platforms. It yeah. actually looks incredibly good. It's a, it is well, a I want to see. <laughs> yeah, let's yeah. do it. Yeah, we need to. The one problem, though, that we've had with the headsets, and this is universal, it's not just Quest, but the headsets use an IMU, so an, 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 an inertial, uh, you know, like a little magnet that kind of tells you where where's your head. Uh, you know, it, it uses motion to estimate where you're at and what you're doing as you're, like, looking around. Oh, the ship. So when you're on a ship and the ship <laughs> is going up and down and left and right, what happens is, like, when you put on the headset, a menu pops up in 3D, and it's normally just the coolest thing because you just reach out and you grab, you know, objects. But on a ship, <laughs> you try to grab it, and your menu suddenly flies away from you because the IMU is like, well, this guy is clearly heaving He's up. He's running. Down, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so you're reaching out, and you're, I would, you know, like, it's, uh, we should, we should film each other trying to, trying because you have to, you have to figure out how do you grab the menu long enough that you can turn off the IMU. So you're just like flailing around trying to grab this menu that's swinging wildly around in 3D. Yeah, yeah. you're just chasing the menu the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think Quinn got it one time where he was actually able to interact for a while, but yeah. other than that, I've had no success catching the menu. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's not, it's not really meant for ships. But <laughs> yeah, that was, they it's good entertainment. They headsets with the, you know, a piloting with a headset on and it's sort of a, a, a challenge to see how long you can go before you throw up. Yep. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Definitely yeah. nauseating. <laughs> well, like, yeah, it's it's a thing. It it the path. This is a problem that people uh, are are solving. Um, one group that comes to mind um, is uh, Blue Ring Imaging, which is actually the the spiritual. Um, uh, uh, it's kind of the, their initial work doing deep sea 3D camera systems like this is is really led to the system that's currently on on the front of ROV Hercules right now. Um, so they're working on a, a pretty innovative new piloting um, heads up display for 3D um, uh, operation of ROVs, um, so that you really have that really nice stereo view of like depth perception of how far your you know arm is, how far are other objects. But I think, and then of course, like it is quite remarkable actually in 3D. You have all of your situational awareness, little um, radars and stuff like that. You can pop up and down, little virtual control. But it's for the now, it's more meant for doing surface operations where you're you're fully controlling the ROV from afar, um, rather than of course out on the ship. Yeah, wearing yeah. a headset, heaving up and down, left and right. While you're looking at an ROV, I would 
I would not want to do well, that. When you get me a gimbal chair, like it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That would you, be cool. <laughs> Johan, how much is left in the survey? Or how much is left in the line? What are uh, I'm going to have us pass by our waypoint just a little bit. Looks um, like we're there. Yeah, so maybe another 15 meters. Okay. And this is it for the Norbit survey then. Sounds good. Totally. And then can we, do we know the depths of the, uh, these kind of high spots on the left and the right of the, what's that little blue channel? Maybe, maybe Chris can chime in. The only reason I ask is because Chris and, maybe, and Zach can help out with the target depths at these corals that we're hoping to see. I just wonder if they're, how they relate to those. Looks like that ridge there where I have the cursor is 398. Yeah, perfect, okay. Yeah, that looks like a perfect depth for the range of the, the species that they were talking about in the paper. Yeah, fantastic. So Jonathan, are we gonna approach the... I'm gonna stop yet? us here, yeah. Okay. Left or right, which, I mean, it, it's bridge, kind of a scale. Bridge, yeah, How big a feature do you wanna? I think that, um, I, I discussed this briefly with Dan. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I was suddenly leaning back towards, oh, let's right, so look around and we do real-time photogrammetry. Down. Um, I think down. But he yeah. reminded me right. that that uh, we did set out for the immersive filmmaking yeah. right off the bat. So I would love to see if we can um, see what the te terrain is like okay. and try to set up kind of a fly through of this What's valley or way? close to one of the valley sides. Uh, from here, and going as slow and steady of a clip as we can manage with uh, our next position. Atalanta but and the wind start at way point issue, etc. Like, okay. I like the idea of a quick visual inspection and yeah, we plan zero. what yeah, we want to do because we may hop right. to the other feature. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'd uh, say if we see a if we see a large high density coral field, that's our we'll just go for it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, Johan, if you were listening, hearing any of that, uh, let's target the smaller feature that's kind of in the middle of the Norbit survey right now. I don't know if you, if Chris can help you with dropping a waypoint or figuring out direction to that. Um, So the scheme will be to, to conduct uh, a quick visual confirmation that it's suitable and then we'll kind of get set up into immersive mode and plan kind of the lights on and lights off and the, all the things to add the drama. Um, okay, I think we need to do a white balance. So. Yeah. I'm happy with that because I'm, I'm just kind of riffing off the white balance of Zeus. Okay. That red thing there. Can you zoom in? What is that? Oh. Huh. Looks like a rinsy stop button. <laughs> Might be the easy button. Easy. <laughs> Yeah, it's got little like tentacles coming out. It looks like little. Oh. Yeah, I can't. I can't tell what it is. Zoom in again. Uh, yeah, I'm stable now. There's another one underneath a piece yeah, of that yeah, sediment. 
semi stable. Ah. Just can't. All right. While they're doing the white balance, Johan, you know where we're going? Uh, not exactly. It looks like Chris is almost done saving his oh, okay. uh, run. It's at like, well, it's going through a few things. But maybe we can get that in in a second. Yeah, I can. Hopefully, I can get you a preliminary map in ten minutes. Okay. So, Chris, can you cue us to, uh, if you'll scroll a little bit, move the map to the right, just to the. Sorry, I uh, I oh. blew it because I switched surveys. Uh, is it something you can see in our sonar? Oh yeah, now I gotta I kind of orient myself. Yeah, flip it 180. Yeah, I th so I think the the target due south is our first. South uh, in this or yeah, south true in this. south? Oh, I don't. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, at the bottom of the sonar image, the large cluster of targets. Roger. Okay. And then we'll. We'll visual inspect that, and then if that's suitable, use that. If not, then we'll go along the wall on the left-hand side of the sonar image. Okay, so that should be due north from us since that is faced 180. You're seeing a white oh, balance that's, that's, uh, test in feed that's one. That's not the best setup. <laughs> <right there. laughs> Does that work to check out that smaller target, Jonathan? And Heck then, yeah. And then we'll move to... I'm all about that. I just want to rule it out. If, yeah. If it... I think we have substantively said what is going to be at the flat area, which is not interesting. Well, the in the the documentation we have describes this area as sparse, right? So we just got to find the yeah, areas it's where it's, it's the densest. For about uh, 10 seconds, we're going to see uh, the camera go dark while we do a auto white balance. Stand by. Thank you. Did you need the arm stuck way out there? What's the scene? It's a pretty cool look. Uh, it's up. It's up to you. Uh, not immediately, but maybe if uh, the arm wasn't so stuck out, but still pointed outwards, if that or rotated outwards, but you know, like, yeah, there you go. Thusly. Yeah. Or do you want it more inboard? It might be. No, I like it out like that for the light. That's where you want it, right there. For now, yeah, it's safer. We call that the stalking praying mantis versus the hunting one. <laughs> Looks like a tiny T-Rex right now, ready Johan to Johan knows all about those praying mantis positions. Yeah, that's true. Johan is setting us up. The only thing that could be better is if uh, Herc is holding the knife and the magnum. <laughs> All right, where are we going? So we're going to start by going north to that 
uh, those features that are just behind the add-on. So if you want to start okay. turning around and coming around on the other side, I'll move us to zero at two north. Okay. Bridge, bridge, nav, two zero meters due north, please. Two zero meters. Thank you. Oh, um, can I get the porch out and unicorn horns out? Porch in and unicorn out. Porch in. Tool tray out. Porch in. Like all the way? Uh, whatever you want for safety margin. Oh, you're going to make it my choice. In more. <laughs> in a bit more? Yeah. Well, in uni unicorn's out first, actually. There you uh, go. Well, like, to the point where they do the droop? No, no droop. Droop bad. So that's, <laughs> yeah. So, so not full out. Medium out. I think that's right on the hairy edge of droop. Right I there. like hairy edges. Okay. Phrasing. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. If the audience needs any help translating these technical terms, <laughs> we can <laughs> just let us so know. So far, we'll so good. I think everybody's on board. I'm just trying to be more descriptive about how they say. Uh, we have, there's an on. Is the porch okay there? Or can we the go porch out? is okay there, yeah. What there's there's no extra. Oh, that's too much, right? Yep. Way that's too much. much. Yeah. Way you can too see much. You can see on the top right uh, the fisheye view. A okay. little, little bit more. There you go. There you go. Is that all right? A little bit more. There you go. Perfect. You got perfect. Some cable for those of you right watching and listening too. at home, Jonathan's trying to get the cameras right in the perfect spot so we can start the photogrammetry as we get closer to the coral beds. Potential. Potential, Potential coral yeah, beds. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. So you got a little that's bit so of cable in your view there. No, I do? Yeah, and your two humps, two little humps. Oh, don't worry about that. that. Robert, it looks like Ada's starting to move. I don't mind that because that helps you Atta. see where the tips are. You're so familiar. It's not that I'm worried about ROV pilots bumping into walls. It's that that's always just a possibility. Okay, so on the screen right now, if you bump over to satellite feed three and you're looking, so you'll, the two 180 degree fish eyes to the left and right, um, those are recording the dual stereoscopic imagery um, that would be suitable for creating VR experiences or projection to things like IMAX, Omnimax, or full room projection systems. And um, the camera that you can see kind of as the backdrop oh, to actually, I that need image to take it the other way. is going to be the um, photogrammetry. Uh, camera, so it's kind of looking down at a 45 degree angle. Or, come on, can you spin around, and take your wrap out? Yeah, no problem. And so the only change that you'll see is if we run across an area of, of very high density so after we record voice. it for yeah. immersive imaging, you'll see me uh, zoom one of those cameras back in one of the stereo cameras because. Uh, to kind of maximize the uh, photogrammetry element of it because two different viewpoints allow for um, better reconstruction success for three-dimensional objects. And um, if you're there and you're listening and, and the analogy, if you, in terms of creating a 3D, um, kind of what these cameras are doing to make 3D, if you close one eye and you just look in front of you right now without moving your head, your capacity for depth perception is very limited because you don't have a real 3D view of the world. So by offsetting these cameras, um, it kind of enables an effect if you now start moving your head back and forth, suddenly you'll see that you kind of have depth perception again. You can see what's closer to you and you can see what's further from you. So that's kind of the same basic concept of what we're doing with this stereo system. And the, for photogrammetry as well is that with a single image, we have different viewpoints of the same object and we can calculate the relative distance uh, of that object from the camera. And the difference, and 
that's the same basic thing that uh, a photogrammetry software is doing, except for it's doing up to 40,000 points for every single image, comparing them across the entire series of images to reconstruct the three-dimensional model of, of what's happening. Thank you for that explanation. I pick up a little bit more every time you explain it. <laughs> Start to understand a little bit more because it's not not my wheelhouse, but definitely something that I'm learning about. Zach, would you mind explaining a little bit more on the back end of uh, kind of the processing elements that are happening in the in the data lab? Yeah. So uh, down in the lab, the uh, the first part of the whole process is just sorting through the data. Um, as Jonathan was mentioning, you know, we got multiple cameras taking photos at the same time, so so we match those up so that they can kind of align with each other. Um, from there, within like the program, it, it's looking for what's known as tie points between each image, and essentially that allows it to overlap and put the two into one. Um, so the more tie points you have, uh, the more accurate your model is going to be. Um, a part of that is uh, moving at a certain rate. Um, Sorry, I just saw something moving on the screen. Um, the ROV moving at a certain rate allows for uh, higher resolution um, as long as we get a certain percent of overlay. Um, if you have a lot, if you have more overlay than you need between, you can get a higher resolution model. It's just going to okay, take agree. much longer to process. Um, and processing time is a big part of what we do also. So uh, we're really working on figuring out that, that perfect mesh there. And then, yeah, we, we put the images through the program, and what it does is going to kind of stack them and form them into a 3D model. And hey, then Zach, hold on just a sec. We'll come back to that. We'll okay. let's just Just a little, little friend down there. So some ancient reef here. Looks like the... The one thing in the documentation about this spot was that uh, Hawaii has a, had an active coral harvesting. Yes. Community. And so this was one of the areas that was corals were harvested from. And so, you know, kind of what we're going to see is the what's been left and survived that now there were there were limits on the take uh, in these areas. But uh, the management, the understanding of how large and the impact of that, I think, was still in the early stages. And so um, I think we're what we're going to see is going to be heavily impacted by potentially the over collection of we uh, do we need to reset Doppler or something? Do we, do we have a heading offset? I don't know. Uh, that looks real. Yeah, that looks about right. It might, might be a coral up to the right. All right. Well, it's happy now. I don't. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Not really clear on what was happening. Yeah, I was yeah. trying to see if I could see anything on the camera faced back at Atalanta, but it's not very clear. I mean, it's dead. Okay. It's dead on now. Yeah. Welcome to our friends from Norway. Thank you for joining us. Well, if yeah, if we if we move and it starts to act weird, we're gonna have to investigate. Yeah. It's stabilized them on my end at least. Yeah, but that's, that could be a fishing line issue maybe, hopefully not, but. Bob, are we in a good place to move out? Uh, we were just looking at what was happening with Atalanta, his heading was wobbling around. Yeah, it seems to settle though, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. We're still going north? Uh, the features that we wanted to look at here are just to uh, the east. Okay. I think. So is that, Johan, in the 
left side of the Zeus image, that was the valley that we imaged that was the deeper blue in the Norbit survey? Um, Is that correct? I'm just trying to get a understanding of scale of, you know. Yeah, I believe so. I'm working on getting Chris, uh, Chris's yeah, cool. model in All right, right now. So. Uh, Hey Chris, I'm it's working got a on a little it. friend there on that right now, rock, little just pink a few one. Happening, putting it in the high pack folder. Uh, zoom yeah. in. Same fish oh, we've seen. Our, our spike fish friend yeah, in the back. Right. Yeah. Not sure what the other one is. Oh, there he is, taking cover. Couple shrimp sticking out two of their holes. Right. <laughs> what a great uh, hiding spot. All right, so we'll move around this uh, feature and then uh, the Large wall to the west, I guess, uh, will be our next target. Hopefully Chris's map comes in and then we can really... They're full wide. Um, can I get down oh. lights off? You get what? Down lights off. Down lights off. And let's try the mids off just for giggles, please. No, we'll do mids back on. And can is the si is the starboard light on right now? Arm light. The arm light's on. Can pointing. we turn that off real quick? So we won't be going much deeper than what we already are. Uh, today, 419 meters is our expected uh, maximum depth, and we are currently right, we at 400. Yeah, so the Zeus camera and the fish eye are the fish eyes are picking up the type of target that we were hoping to find structure-wise, and it it does have quite a few corals on it. I can't wait to. Yeah, it's quite large ones. Yeah. It's Spend some time here. Yep. This looks good. I yeah. agree. I agree. Oh, yeah. I'll take this. Oh, yeah. Oh, look at wow. Look, look, look. The one up top? Oh, my. So, just so we don't waste <laughs> a single second of ship time here, um, can we just take a pause? I'm going to trust that this is going to look fantastic. You think? Look oh at the Zeus gosh. image. Look how... I know, I know. This is going to be awesome. It's going to be incredible. So <laughs> let's get the, uh, if we can, can we concentrate on getting Atalanta um, uh, yeah, kind of a, above this feature to be the primary light. Um, and then we're going to do the same kind of thing um, where we turn on the lights um, as we're starting to move forward. So wow. I think the first request from ROV is, can we please uh, maneuver the ship and ROV Atlanta to be at an appropriate standoff distance for that lights on camera action kind of shot, please. All right. Yes. So these are those Girardia corals that you're talking about, Devin? Yeah, we can tell with the gold color. That is. Yep, I'm going to move this ship. That, that one looks rather large. Massive. Yeah, that one's thousands of years old. Bridge, bridge, nav, three zero at zero four zero, please. They estimate a lot of these corals only grow about one millimeter a year, so do the Coming math up, on that you. big one there. Wow. It looks like we've got a primnoida species at the bottom. Uh, good job, team. This was kind of our whole objective was to find something like this today and the Norbit was a key tool to have to uh, to get us here. Wow. Quite a 
quite successful so far. We got I our could, mapping in. I could sit here for hours and just yeah. like, explore the nooks and crannies of something like this. This is really, really fun. Agreed. Yeah. Oh yeah, we're seeing in the top of the Zeus camera too additional coral. Wow. Um, Bob, using the top-down cinema camera on the top monitor, can you try to do frame up that nice yeah. coral? Yep. Oh. Do you want it in close or? or no. Yeah. Just like that, and let's do a nice slow spin around it while we're yeah. while we're waiting for. Got some urchins up top, some fish. Oh, it's actually wiggling oh, uh, around too much, right? Is now. it what? It's wiggling around too much for a good photogrammetry, so I'll stop that. Yeah, we're stretched out. So yeah, it's okay. You gotta so stand by a minute. I could come back the other way. So something like this, though, this is the, you know, we dedicated this whole dive to finding something like this, and so this could, we can take our time and approach this really deliberately, top yeah. to bottom. Make and sure just, we get this. Yeah. Kristen, did you get those IDs for this part? I think the, the gold ones we're looking at are the Gerardia, and then yep. I'm not sure if the other ones, if they're a bamboo or yeah. one of the Primnoide species. They look like uh, bamboo to me, and yeah. I got the other one too. Yeah, Okay. the gold corals. Yeah, if we zoom in, we'll definitely... Do you know what these there. fish are? Because I certainly don't. No, I... <laughs> it's I'll hard to tell. Those. Yeah, I was looking for all the corals first, yeah. but I'll, I'll look through the fish quick. I looked at that one that we had initially seen. It was definitely a spike fish. Yeah, the like, yeah, goofy species, face one. Yeah, species yeah. that are related to the trigger fish have rather large protruding lips. That makes sense. They're related to trigger fish. Mm -hmm. Some people argue that uh, trigger fish are the most evolved family because their skin is so thick. Nothing really wants to eat them. There's actually like, a little bit of toxin kind of thing in it. Um, and there's spikes. Yeah, the spikes. Yeah, it's defense. And they just feed on the minimum. They don't have a lot of requirement. Kristen, these fish might be um, the black chins. Neoscopelidae is the one I'm looking okay. at, maybe. This one's. Looks like it's struggling to move. We can get closer. <laughs> when it gets closer, we'll know. <laughs> Is that, do you see the coral off to the left? Um, does that look like a, a, a corallium to you? It's hard to tell. Uh, I can't tell really. Which camera are you looking at? Satellite V1. Do you think uh, perk? you can uh, do a flying zoom of the purple fish? Ooh, look at that. Yeah, the purple oh, fish? that is not yeah. a black chin. I don't know what that one is. Wow. With the cinema cam? 